Turn your Bibles, if we will, to Hebrews chapter 10. I'd like to say good morning to everybody here, especially our visitors. We do have visitors in our midst, and we're so grateful for that. We hope that you'll pay close attention to the things that you see and hear. And if you have any questions, let us know about that. We'd be more than happy to discuss those matters with you. Come back and be with us anytime you have opportunity. We'll meet tonight at 5 o'clock for another period of worship. And Wednesday nights we meet at 7. We have Bible classes for all ages. So come and be with us for any or all of those services. In Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 19, Paul gives an admonition. I say Paul. I'm, I'm of the view that Paul wrote Hebrews. We really don't know who wrote it. But the writer gives the uh, exhortation here to faithfulness. In verse 19, he says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and having high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another in so much the more as you see the day approaching. This section here, as I said, is an exhortation to faithfulness. The Hebrew Christians were being tempted to turn away from Jesus and to turn back to Moses. And so the Hebrew writer spends a lot of time talking about the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant and encouraging them to understand that the New Covenant is a better covenant established on better promises with better sacrifices. Better becomes a key word in the Hebrew letter. And so he's exhorting them not to leave Moses, or not to leave Christ, excuse me, and go back to Moses, but to stay faithful to Jesus Christ. And in verse 19, having boldness to enter the holiest, that's the presence of God. He's drawing on imagery from the Old Testament, the holy place in the tabernacle. But the holiest basically represented in the tabernacle the presence of God. So we're coming into the presence of God. So we have that context here. We're coming into God's presence and do it boldly. That means confidently, by the way. It doesn't mean arrogantly, but it means confidently. Because by the blood of Jesus, we have that confidence to be able to come into God's presence. In verse 22, he gets to the specifics. Number one, let us draw near. In verse 22, he's talking about drawing near to God. And so part of being faithful is drawing nearer to God with each passing day. He talks about having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, sprinkled by the blood of Jesus. And our bodies washed with pure water. That's an allusion to baptism. So notice the connection between the blood of Jesus and baptism. Uh, you can't have one without the other. The way we contact or access the blood of Jesus is in the waters of baptism. In verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope. That's our obligation to ourselves. So verse 22, our obligation to God, draw near. Verse 23, our obligation to ourselves, hold fast. And then verse 24, our obligation to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Let us consider one another. We need to think about each other as brothers and sisters in the Lord. And he says we need to stir up love and good works. The old King James says to provoke. And I kind of like that translation. Uh, both translations are correct and, and valid. But I like provoke because sometimes we think of provoke in a negative way. We say, well, he provoked a fight. And here we're provoking all right, but we're not provoking a fight. We're provoking love and good works. We're trying to, uh, we're trying to bring that out of our brethren, stirring up and provoking love and good works. And one of the ways that we do that is by not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, you see. So we need to be together. We need to get together often. And so faithfulness to God includes assembling with other saints. Over the years as a preacher, I've often been asked the question, do I really have to come to every service? And I've always believed that's the wrong question. <laughs> that's just not the right question at all. Uh, the, the question, when we start saying, do I have to attend? Do I have to pray? Do I have to study my Bible? What that's showing is a reluctance to commit to God. Well, you know, I, I just want, just give me the bare minimum. I just want to do the bare minimum. I don't want to do any more. I don't want to do anything extra. Just tell me what, do I have to pray? Do I have to study? Do I have to assemble? And I think those questions are just as wrong-headed as they can be. The right question, if I can put it to you, is why wouldn't you want to be here? That's really the right question. And why would you not want to be here? What is it that you find so offensive about assembling with the saints that you, you know, I don't want to be here, and I'm going to find every reason I can not to come? 
I think you're on the wrong foot. You're starting out in the wrong place. So I want to look at this question not from the standpoint of do I have to, but I want to explain to you why I want to. I want to be here every time the doors are open. I want to be here every chance that we get. I want to be here every night of a gospel meeting. I want to be here when we have special studies. I want to be here for Bible classes. I want to be here for worship. And so I want us to think about why I want to assemble all that I can. And plug yourself into the equation. Why you want to be here or why you should want to be here. First thing I would suggest to you is the obvious one, of course, and that is to worship God. Now, I can already hear the objector. Well, I can worship God all by myself. You sure can. You sure can. First question I have in return is, do you? Do you? Most people who say that don't. They just say that, but they don't. And yes, you can worship God by yourself. Turn with me, if you will, to James chapter 5. James chapter 5. And notice the personal nature of this. He's talking about here our personal devotions. Hopefully you do do this. We are required to do this. Is anyone among you suffering? Watch it now. Let him pray. This isn't talking about church. This is talking about you. This is your day-to-day -day life. You're going through some hard times. You're suffering. Turn to God. That should be as natural as breathing air. The first thing you want to do when you're suffering is to turn to God in prayer. Is anyone cheerful? You happy? Then let him sing psalms. And that should just be a natural expression of devotion. And notice the emphasis on the hymn. Is anyone? Let him. And so, yes, we can worship God alone. And I would argue we should worship God alone. Hopefully you do. Hopefully you do worship God more than just Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. Hopefully you worship God throughout the week. We all should do that. However, God also requires together worship. Turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. And this was the birthday of the Church of Christ. And, of course, Peter preached a fiery sermon on that day, indicting the Jews of crucifying the very Son of God. And they were pricked in their hearts, as verse 36 indicates. Or verse 37, I'm sorry. When they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. This tells us, by the way, that the invitation to obey the gospel is for everybody. It's not just for the Jews. Some people like to make Acts 2 just for the Jews. Oh, no, I'm afraid not. He says it's for you, the Jews. It's for your children. And it's for all who are afar off. That brings in the Gentiles, you see. And so this, this invitation, this gospel invitation is for everybody. But Verse uh, 41 says, those who gladly received his word were baptized. So there are people who responded to Peter's sermon. But notice verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Two words I want you to zero in on. The first word is the word steadfastly. That means it kept on going. It wasn't a one-time thing. It was an ongoing thing. And then the second word I want you to notice is the word fellowship. Fellowship. Do you really know what fellowship is? It's doing things together. That's what it is. Fellowship means joint participation. That's what the word literally means. J joint participation. It's things we do together. And so they're doing this together. Together. What are they doing together? Well, they're learning from the apostles' doctrine. They're breaking the bread of the Lord's Supper. They're continuing in prayers. This worship went on. And say, well, how often? Well, I'll tell you exactly how often because verse 46 says they did it every day. Think of that. Think of that. You know, some of us whine if it's three times a week. And here they did it every day, continuing daily with one accord in the temple. That's where they met to worship. And breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. These people were together every day, every single day. And they weren't saying, do I have to? That's not, they weren't saying that. They saying, I want to. I want to. I want to come. I want to learn. I want to be there. I want to worship God. And worship is basically the way that we express our love for the God of heaven. We express our love and our praise and our devotion, and we do it in a God-pleasing way. We are familiar with John 4, 24. Jesus said, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. There's two aspects to acceptable worship. Spirit, that's our attitude. And the attitude should be, I want to. 
That's the attitude. Having the spirit, the right spirit, you see. And in truth, doing it according to God's word. And so true worship of God should not be a matter of do I have to. It should be a matter of I really want to. It reminds me of something David said long, long ago in Psalms 122 and verse 1. I was glad when they said to me, let us go up to the house of the Lord. Notice the let us. We're worshiping together. What's at the house of the Lord? Other believers. And what are we going up to the house of the Lord for? To worship. And how do you feel about David? I'm glad. I want to. David didn't say, oh, do I have to go to the house of the Lord again? Do I have to make another trip up Mount Zion again? That wasn't David's attitude. His attitude is, I'm glad. I want to. I really want to do this. I want to throw in another thought here. Turn your Bibles to Matthew 5. This is from the Sermon on the Mount. And you ever heard somebody use the expression, well, he went the extra mile. He went the extra mile. And well, that comes right out of the Sermon on the Mount. And in Matthew 5 and verse 41, I know he was talking about a different subject here, but I want you to get the principle that's involved. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also, verse 41. And whoever compels you to go with him one mile, go with him two. Go the extra mile. Christianity is a second mile religion. Can I say that again? Christianity is a second mile religion. God doesn't want you trying to see what the minimum is that you can squeak by with. God wants you to give him your all, to do the extra thing. If someone compels you to go one mile, go two. Do the extra thing. Go the extra mile. And so this is the attitude of the Christian. Why do I want to? because I live under a second mile religion and I want to do all that I can to please my God. I want to do all that I can to show him how much I love him. That's really what worship is all about, isn't it? It's not about you and it's not about me. It's about God and it's about showing him that. And I want to show him that. I want him to know whose side I'm on. Reminds me of a story uh, many years ago. There was an old uh, saint who wasn't really able to come to services. He had an oxygen tank and he walked with a cane, and it was very difficult for him to get there. And, and they, they brethren said, you know, you're so sick, everybody would understand if you stayed home. And you know what his response was? I want everybody to know whose side I'm on. Oh, I like that. I, like, I just want everybody, yeah, I know I'm sick. I know it would be a lot easier for me to stay home, but I want everybody to know whose side I'm on. Are you on the Lord's side? Do you want to serve him? Do you want to worship him? This should be your attitude. That's why I want to worship. I want to worship God. Secondly, there's a second aspect of worship. I want to encourage other people. See, this is all about not just God, but it's about others as too. The act of assembling not only looks upward toward God, which we've talked about in that first point, but it also looks outward to one another. Uh, if we fail, going back to Hebrews 10, remember what he said there in Hebrews 10, 24, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. If we fail to do that, we are acting selfishly. Think of that. We are acting. Selfishness doesn't get it with God. Selfishness doesn't cut it with the Lord. We can't be selfish. Well, it's my time and my pleasures and what I want to do. This isn't about you. It's about others. Turn your Bibles, if you will, to Philippians chapter 2. And, and notice how Paul brings this out very vividly in these verses. Philippians 2 verses 3 and 4. Paul says, let each of you look out not only for his own interests, don't just be focused on you, but also for the interests of others. Think about the other guy. Think about your brothers and sisters in Christ. He says in, in uh, verse 3, I, I meant to read verse 3 too as introduction, let nothing be done through selfish ambition. Selfish ambition, that's what I want, see. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, that's arrogance. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. So I want to come because I'm looking out for the interests of others. I want you to be encouraged. I want you to be built up. I spend a lot of time uh, through the week putting together sermons and classes and trying to get everything just right in my head so I can present it in a way that's interesting, so I can present it in a way that's edifying, so I can present it in a way that will help you. That's what I want to do. I chose that as my life work, you see. I want to, and we should have, whether you're in the pulpit or not, we should have the same attitude. I'd like to be there to encourage Lanny. 
you see. I'd like to be there to encourage somebody else. And so in worship, not only are we looking upward to God, but we're looking around at each other. Let's look at some passages here. Colossians 3 and verse 16, for instance. He says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. Did you see that? If you write in your Bibles, underline the word one another. Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. The one another aspect, that is also an aspect of worship. There's an upward aspect to God, and there's an outward aspect to one another. And we should want to be here so we can teach and admonish one another, so we can encourage one another, you see. Moving on out here to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Paul gives an exhortation to the brethren at Thessalonica. He says, therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. Notice, by the way, they're already doing it. He said, I want you to keep doing it. Do it all the more. Keep on doing this. Keep on comforting one another. Keep on edifying one another. And then turn over to 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 26 I told you in Bible study this morning that in this section of the Corinthian letter that we're studying, he's dealing with a lot of issues relative to public worship. And here you can see it very clearly in verse 26. How is it then, brethren, whenever you come together? So here's a gathering of the church. Whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let me just stop there and make the observation. Did you notice how everybody wanted to participate? How everybody, I want to do whatever I can do. Some have a teaching, and some have a psalm, and some have a doctrine, and some have a revelation. Some have an interpretation. Now, some of that, I know, applies to spiritual gifts. I got that. But notice how everybody wants to participate. I want to be a part of this. We're all meeting together here, and I want to be a part of this. And then the overriding principle, the last sentence there, let all things be done for edification. Edification is building up. Sometimes when you drive down the road and you see a building, we refer to that as an edifice. We, we, some of us, uh, uh, not so fancy people, will say building. But fancy people, they say that's an edifice. That's an edifice, and that's a building. And so to edify is to build a building. And so it's metaphorically applied here to building the church, to building the family of God, to building up the people of God. And he says that's the overriding principle. That's why we come together. That's one of the reasons. We come together to worship God, yes, but we also come together uh, to uh, edify, build up one another. By the way, just as an aside, and this isn't a criticism because I think we do fine on this, but just throw it out there, note to the leadership, elders and deacons, we set the tone. We set the tone for the rest of the congregation by our participation, by our attendance, by our uh, uh, leadership in these matters. We set the tone for the rest of the church. You see, and again, that's not a criticism. I think our elders and deacons do fine. They're here, and, and they're present, and they're, they're, in, they're a part of it. But I just want you to know, we set the tone for everybody else. And so if we get lax, don't be surprised if everybody else gets lax. So leadership sets the tone for others. Turn over to Philippians 3 and 17 to reinforce this point. Paul uses himself as the example here, Philippians 3, 17. He says, brethren... Join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. Let's be the pattern. Let's be the one everybody looks to. I want to be like him. I want to lead singing like him. I want to teach class like him. I want to lead prayer like him. I want to participate like him. I want to be like that fellow or like that lady, you see. And so let's, let's realize we can set the tone for the rest of the church, not just the leadership, but we can all set the tone for one another by our example. Well, why else do I want to come to services? Why do I want to assemble as much as I possibly can? To gain spiritual strength. That's, that's one of the reasons. You know, assembling is difficult for the selfish. We mentioned earlier that it's a selfish thing when we start thinking, do I have to? That's a selfish thing. Instead of, I want to. You see, that's unselfish. And so there's a different attitude there. And so assembling is difficult for the selfish because it focuses on other people instead of themselves. But there is a selfish aspect, isn't there? I want something out of this. I want something out of this. I don't want to just give something. I want to get something. 
I want to gain something. And so I want to gain spiritual strength. And you can do that when you assemble with the saints. You know, we're required to grow in knowledge. We're required to grow in faith and required to grow in strength. Let's look at a few passages here. 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter 2 verses 1, 2, and 3. And he says, therefore, laying aside all malice, all guile, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire, stop. Did you see that word? That's, that's another word for want to. <laughs> want to. Desire the pure milk of the word. Why? That you may grow thereby. That's our point right there. To gain spiritual strength. To grow. Desire it. Don't. Find an excuse not to have it, but find every reason to have it. Desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow, if indeed you've tasted that the Lord is gracious. Turning on over to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. There's growth. That takes place. We're commanded to grow. That's not an option. I've known people, it's kind of sad, but I've known people who've been Christians for years and they don't know any more Bible than they did when they started 30 or 40 years ago. And, and that's not a good place to be. We should be growing and developing in our knowledge, all of us. Uh, don't stay static. Don't just stay with the basics. You know, hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized and, and preach and, and give and commune and, and listen to a sermon. Don't just stay with the basics. Get beyond that. Get beyond that and grow, you see. That's a command. And yes, as I said at the very beginning, we can do that privately and should do so privately. In 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15, study, listen, to show thyself. To show thyself approved unto God. A worker who does not need to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. Yes, we can do it individually. I hope that you do. I hope that you are. I hope that you don't just leave here and take your Bible and stick it under the seat of the car and never open it again until the next service. I hope, I hope that's not the case. Take that Bible in the house with you and open it up during the week and study it. Open it up during the week and learn what it says. So yes, we do this individually, but we also gain much by joint study, don't we? Those of you who are here, especially in our Bible classes where there can be give and take, where there can be questions and answer, and you think about the study we had this morning. And, and, and we can gain a lot from that interaction with one another. We can test one another and ask questions of one another, and we can gain something from that. Let me show you a passage on this. Romans chapter 1. The Apostle Paul, was he was dying to make a trip to Rome to see these brethren. And I want you to think about the language he uses here. Romans 1, verses 11 and 12. Verse 11, for I long to see you. Oh, look at that. Just, just look at that and think about it. Paul says, I'm dying to get over there to Rome. I'm dying to get over there to see my brethren in Rome. I long to see you. Why? That I may impart to you some spiritual gift. I want to help you. I want to help you. I can't wait to get there so that you may be established. What do you mean, Paul? That is, verse 12, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith of both you and me. Did you see that? I'm, I'm dying to get there to Rome. I want us to be able to interact. I want us to be able to share our faith, to share our study, to share our knowledge, to learn off of each other. Do you see what he's saying here? And this is the Apostle Paul, by the way. He didn't say, I already know everything. That's not, I'm dying to be there. I want to share with you. I want to interact with you. I want to be strengthened from the process. And this is so true. We all know if we come to these studies, we know that's true. We gain something from it, don't we? It's important for us that we do this. And so I want to be here because I get something out of it every single time. I guarantee you I do. I get something out of it every single time. And then finally, I want to be here because we need to build family unity. Now the Bible talks about brothers and sisters in Christ. And the, the emphasis on the brothers and sisters. So we're a spiritual family. And Unity is required in that family. Turn with me, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 4. And Paul deals with the subject of unity 
In fact, most of us are familiar with the first six verses where he says in verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So this is an appeal for unity. And he talks about some of the things upon which we can unite. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Oh, I forgot verse 4, one body and one spirit. There's seven ones there, seven ones. And we unite upon that, you see. And so the theme here is unity. How are we going to achieve that? Verse 11 tells us. He says in verse 11, And he himself, the he there is Jesus, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Did you notice something about every one of those functionaries? The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors. There's one thing they all have in common. Every single one of them is a teacher. Did you notice that? Every single one of them had a teaching role. And this is part of, of, of building a unity. We come together. We worship God. We encourage each other. We strengthen ourselves. And in the process, we're building a family here. You're going to see this in the next few verses. He gave, Jesus gave, by the way, notice it doesn't say he gave gifts to these. Because that's not his point. He did, but that's not his point. He gave these. That's what he gave. He gave apostles. He gave prophets. He gave evangelists. He gave pastors and teachers. Why? For the equipping of the saints. That's you all. The saints. For the equipping of the saints. For the work of the ministry. By the way, did you notice that? You're the ministers in this verse. Sometimes people say, well, the preacher is our minister. Well, I'm a minister, but you're ministers too. And in this verse, I'm equipping you to do ministry. You're the ministers in this verse. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, you go out and you do the ministry. Reminds me of a sign I saw on a church years ago. There was a sign as you went out the door. Up there, ours says exit. But at this congregation, they had a different sign. And up there above the door, it says, you are now entering the mission field. I like that. I like that. We come in here to get pumped up. We come in here to get edified. We come in here to get strong. And then we go out there and do the work of ministry. That's what that verse is telling us. And here it comes. For the edifying of the body of Christ. Well, how long? Verse 13. Till we all come to the unity of the faith. There's the family of God right there. Coming together in unity. Unity is a process. It's a process that's achieved through teaching. It's a process that's achieved through worship. It's a process that's achieved through being together and learning and benefiting one from another, you see. And so you, you have this, this idea of coming to the unity of the faith. And by the way, look at the high bar he sets here. To the knowledge of the Son of God. I've been preaching over 40 years and I ain't got there yet. I'm working on it, but I ain't got there yet. And so I got, I got, a, big, I got a big job before me, and you do too. To the, to the knowledge of, have you got there yet? Have you got to the knowledge of the Son of God? I haven't. To a perfect man, the word perfect means mature, by the way. It doesn't mean flawless or sinless. It means mature. The measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Well, I ain't there. I'm working on it. I'm working on it, but I ain't there yet. I can't say I'm as good as Jesus, and neither can you. But that's the point. You see, you leave the bar right where God put it. That's where you've got to be like Jesus. And then you keep striving and keep striving and keep striving. And in the process of that striving, we're building a unity. Notice that. Till we all come to the unity of the faith. How? Through teaching. <coughs> Through teaching. Being together. Teaching one another. Admonishing one another. And so think about this. How can you grow in love and appreciation for a family that you rarely see? Kind of hard to do, isn't it? It's kind of hard to grow in love and appreciation for a family that you rarely see. And, and it's a lot easier if they see you every once in a while. If you show up every once in a while. The more time we spend together, the greater sense of unity we will have. It will, it will be a process. It will be a growth process. But we'll grow together. We'll grow closer together. And, and we'll grow in love for each other. And we'll grow in love for the Lord. I'm persuaded and I've said this many times in many sermons, I'm persuaded that we actually need more togetherness, not less. You know, I'm all for the three times a week, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, I'm all for that. But I'm persuaded we need more togetherness, and listen to me carefully, not just in worship. Can I say that again? Not just in worship. Let's go back here. We looked at this earlier in Acts chapter 2. and It was verse 46. And look at these early Christians here. 
Continuing daily. Notice they did this every single day. Continuing daily with one accord in the temple. That's where they worshipped. They went to the temple to worship God. And breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food. This is where this is their social life. These people were together socially every day. Think about that. And this church was growing. This church was prospering. And I'm saying to you, this church, I'm reading about here, was together more than just three times a week. This church was together in worship. They were together socially, and they were together every day. Now, I'm not, I'm not pushing for everyday worship here. I'm not, it's not what I'm pushing for, but I'm saying we need more togetherness, not less. And I think that's true. The more we are, the more, and I know the church is not a social club. I got that. I understand that. Notice they met in the temple, and they broke bread from house to house. They saw the separation. The church is not a social club. I get it. But we do have obligations outside of the assembly, don't we? We have obligations one to another. And if we want to build the kind of family unity that God really wants, it would help if we got together more often, wouldn't it? I think that's something for us to think about. And so these are just a few of the reasons why I want to be here every chance I get. I want to be here for the Sunday morning Bible study. I want to be here for the worship. I want to be here for the Wednesday night Bible study. Those are just some of the reasons. I relish the opportunities for Bible study the opportunity for worship, the opportunities for gospel meetings, the private studies. I relish those opportunities. And I have a hard time understanding why anyone who claims to be a Christian would neglect it. I, I, I have a hard time understanding that. Where are you coming from? Where are you coming from in neglecting these wonderful opportunities? I would suggest that being neglectful here is dangerous to your soul. Because these are things God expects of us. You thought about that? God expects us to worship Him. God expects us to encourage one another. God expects us to gain spiritual strength. God expects us to grow in unity. And when we fail to do that or refuse to do that, we're endangering our very own souls. That's just a fact. And so I hope that you'll take a good, long, hard look at that and think about the things we've talked about this morning. Take out your songbooks, if you will, and turn to the Song of Invitation. Number 268. Hark the gentle voice. You know, if we were to talk to some of our religious friends, they actually think God does speak to you in a still, small voice, don't they? But that's not really what he's talking about in this song. The gentle voice of Jesus comes to us through the pages of Scripture. He had his gentle voice recorded by his apostles. And the gentle voice of Jesus comes to us through the scripture. And we need to listen. The word hark means listen. Listen to that gentle voice. He wants you to come. He wants you to obey. He wants you to be faithful. What must I do to be saved? That's what the Philippian jailer asked, wasn't it, in Acts 16. What must I do to be saved? The answer is simple. Believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Repent of your sins. Confess your faith in Christ and be baptized. Now listen carefully. Once you've done that, you're just getting started. You're not done. You're just getting started. That brings you into the family of God. That brings the remission of sins. That brings you into a relationship. But you arise and walk in newness of life. That's the part we sometimes let down on. We sometimes don't do it. You rise and walk in newness of life. And part of that walk would be some of the things we talked about this morning. Part of that walk is living moral, godly lives. Part of that walk is teaching others the gospel. But the invitation goes out to you today. Do you need to obey Christ? If so, won't you come while we stand and while we sing?